Welcome to day two of New America's Planetary Politics Digital Futures Symposium. Uh, we're going to open today with a fireside chat titled The Global Architecture of Digital Cooperation, moderated by New America CEO Anne Marie Slaughter and featuring the former president and CEO of ICANN, Mr. Fadi Chahadi. The conversation will explore the challenges and possibilities for global governance of the digital domain. Uh, in addition to leading New America, Anne Marie Slaughter is a member of the UN Secretary General's High Level Advisory Board on Effective Multilateralism. She was also formerly the head of policy planning in the State Department under Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Um, Anne Marie has been thinking, writing, and speaking about networks and global governance for the better part of two decades, well over two decades. Um, and Fadi was a highly successful internet entrepreneur. Uh, before he spent four years from 2012 to 2016 leading ICANN. ICANN is the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, which sounds esoteric, but it is the multi-stakeholder body without which a secure and stable global internet simply could not exist. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Anne Marie. Gordon, thank you, thank and you. good morning, everybody. I heard, uh, at least talking to some of you after your working groups yesterday, that lots of work is getting done and lots of ideas for carrying on the work. So I'm, again, it's, it's terrific to have you all here. And it's, it's really a pleasure to be able to kick this off with Fadi. Fadi and I met about a decade ago, maybe more, maybe 12 to 13 years, but we were instant kindred spirits. We were introduced by a mutual friend and we are, um, we are inhabitants and believe, inhabitants of and believers in the networked world. Uh, from from uh, uh, Fadi, from all his his work, really, uh, yes, as head of ICANN, but also as a builder of networks, both commercial uh, and also uh, governance networks of, of different kinds. And that has been what I have pursued as a scholar. I wrote my first article on networks in 1994 uh, on judges talking to one another around the world, and it's been a passion ever since. So if you look at the etched glass there behind the stairs, it's not accidental that it is, it is networks. It's something that we, we believe in. Uh, and Fadi has been very important uh, advising the Secretary General of the UN on his concept of networked multilateralism. Uh, and Fadi got me involved early on when the Secretary General was new and really thinking about how do we build out from the multilateralism of 1945 what uh, he's unfortunately no longer with us, but the great political scientist John Ruggie uh, used to call the multilateralism of headquarters and stationary <laughs> and acronyms, right? That, the very fixed multilateralism uh, of, of the post-war system to the far more fluid and complex world that we now inhabit where you, you do have those buildings, you do have those organizations. I, I, would, I for one, would not start over but that fixed, bureaucratic, hierarchical, rigid world is extremely ill-suited for the complexity uh, of the challenges we face and, of course, so many other actors. So there, you know, as head of ICANN, you were literally registering the, the, the inhabitants of the digital world. Uh, and thinking about how do we now live in the digital world as well as the physical world, meet those challenges, and above all, put them together in various ways. So it's just a pleasure to be able to do this. Um, and I'm going to start by asking you, if you would, to describe what the panel you were on, the High Level Advisory Board, there are many, but you were on the one on digital cooperation. And I want to start by asking you to talk about what you meant by digital cooperation, which is not the same as digital governance, right? That was not, and I think it's important. We're all thinking about digital governance, but there's, a, there's a, another dimension here that I'd like you to bring out. So if you just talk about what you meant uh, and talk about that experience. That was co-chaired by Melinda Gates and Jack Ma. It was. Thank you, Marie. I'm, deli I'm delighted to be with you, and I just want to correct the record. Everything I've done was inspired by her writing, by her uh, academic work, uh, 
uh, one of the books that has the most markings in my library is her book because uh, networked governance was really a concept that she mastered and she brought to all of us. And I, I really want to commend her for that because without that thinking, um, I don't think we had the framework, all of us, to function to do what we did. So thank you for that. Um, digital cooperation is not only important, it's urgent. Um, I'm sure you're all reading and seeing what's going on with uh, artificial intelligence now. And last night I had dinner with the program director at ARPA who ran the AI group in 1963. 63, I was a year old, and I said, Steve, I mean, really, there was an AI group in ARPA really already thinking how, the, he says, yeah, I, I was the first head of the AI program office at uh, ARPA. So there is uh, a, a, an important moment now to understand that if we don't cooperate as these technologies really are coming to a critical point of embedded, being embedded in the physical world. You know, IBM, 15 years ago, Irving came up with the idea of a smart planet where, you know, there is now physical infrastructure and digital infrastructure intertwined. But frankly, he was way ahead of his time. It is happening now. And we're seeing it, and that's why you're seeing scientists quit jobs and people not knowing what to do, because it's a critical moment. If we do not cooperate, and that means all people of goodwill in government, in business, especially in business, especially in business. I put a line under that because I'm from that world. And then, of course, all of us as citizens, as users, if we don't cooperate to define what is civilization going to look like moving forward when the machines and humans will be a hybrid entity, so digital is no longer something separate. Your vision, when you wrote about the, the world coming together, frankly, is now happening. It didn't happen before. Um, we won't know very soon if we're talking about a human or a machine or a combo. We, very soon. This is almost there. And I'm, I'm not terrified. I actually think there will be lots of good out of that. But we need cooperation and, and honest commitment because the amount of money that is chasing the intertwining of digital and physical is so high. I mean, from 20 million a couple of years ago in that space to 20 billion this year and probably 200 billion next year, the way the money is going. So when money goes after something, it becomes even more urgent that we cooperate and we make things transparent. Transparent is uh, one of the key words and concepts we pushed in the UN Digital Cooperation Panel because if things happen behind walls and behind doors, they can develop in ways that may not be good for all. So was the vision of that the, the panel came out with it, it was it a vision of nations cooperating on digital issues in digital space? I mean, because you could imagine a whole new United Nations, right? You had the United Nations of physical space, and you have the United Nations in digital space. But that's very broad. Was there a kind of, of anchoring vision? Yes, the anchoring vision is anchored, frankly, in your concept of a networked model, meaning the, the reason it's worked to date in the digital space is because we never had a single authority. Uh -huh. I think if we continue thinking of the governance of the digital world as a networked environment, just like the internet is, the internet is there. <clears throat> I mean, have any of you been able to say, where is the internet? Is there one network called the internet? In fact, the internet is today about 89,000 networks, specifically understood by people who know the digital infrastructure. But how does it look like one internet? Because 
the people who designed it, designed it as a highly network distributed model, but that collaborated. Those 89,000 networks collaborate. They work together. They have common norms which are built into protocols. Now, imagine if we create a governance model that looks like the internet, that doesn't have a center. <clears throat> At ICANN, I was responsible for something called the root of the internet. Very few people know how the root but works. I've never heard of the root of the so internet. The root of the internet is 13 systems, literally systems, 10 in the United States, one in Japan, one in the Netherlands, and one in Sweden. Wow. And those 13 systems are the route that determines where all the traffic goes. It, it has the, the core addresses that say, so in that route, for example, it, we put that if you type any address that ends with .org, it goes to a machine run by .org or dot, if it's IBM.com it then or IBM.org it will send it to them. That's all in the root. It's the most attacked system on the planet because if it's down, the root of the internet will be down. Everything will still be there but you won't find it. So I mentioned the root because the root itself is a model of networked governance. So who runs these 13? You could find out, you go online, who runs the 13 root nodes of the internet? One of which is run by the University of Maryland, for example. One of which is run by USC. One of which is run by a small company you've never heard of in Holland. Now, when ICANN was responsible for the root, could I call these 13 people and say, please remove dot Russia from the root, which would stop anybody finding any website in Russia. And by the way, there were pressure on ICANN in the last few months to do so. Jeez. Russia is an aggressor. Remove them from the root. There was a huge pressure on ICANN to do that. And within ICANN, there was a multi-stakeholder dialogue, including governments and businesses and civil society users saying, should we remove Russia given their aggression? And the answer was, of course not. It's not our business to decide. Just like I decided when I was head of ICANN, you know, when the Houthis were telling me, you know, you need to give us Dot Yemen and the other, and I said, I, no, we don't do that. It's not our business to get involved in this. The internet maintained its stability because we have a very networked model. And even if ICANN told the root operators, remove Russia, they have a mechanism to consult amongst themselves and say, even though ICANN is the coordinator, we think that's they're being influenced. We're not going to do it. There is networked uh, governance at every level of the digital infrastructure. And that's why it's working. Have you ever typed IBM.com and ended up at HP? Never. It's never, never. It never broke. Because it's stable. It's resilient. It's governed just like it looks like physically. Wow. I, I'm fascinated. I'm, I can tell, actually, those of you who have technical backgrounds, we're all nodding like, yeah, of course. <laughs> and some <laughs> of us, I thought I knew quite a bit about the internet, but I never understood, I didn't know about the, the root systems. So one of my questions was to ask you to, to talk about the lessons from ICANN as the, the governance of the internet for, for governing the digital spaces more broadly. I mean, we've been we're talking mm. about digital governance, but I, I also want to ask you at the same time, Candace said yesterday that, that people in the planetary politics initiative here is also about decentering tr traditional power that that and you can talk about that simply in terms of a, a multi aligned world as as the Indian external secretary uh, the secretary for external affairs talks about it uh, in terms of geopolitical shifts you can talk about it in terms of the shift from nations to 
commercial and civic actors. Um, but you're talking about something even more profound, that, it's, that there is no center one can point to. And thus, many, many stakeholders have a say. So I'd love to hear more about you know, and maybe also you can start about how the governance, how ICANN itself evolved from mm -hmm. an American entity to a, a global entity and what lessons you take from that. Wow. Uh, that was many questions lots, lots ro to rolled back. into but one. You a, can it, pick and choose. I'll okay. now follow up. Look, I'll, I'll start, if you would excuse me, with just a minute to make sure we all understand the layers of governance and fragmentation. So I'll give you a very simplistic model of four layers that make the digital world we want to govern. There's the physical infrastructure, the networks, everything that moves the bits, right? There's thousands, as I mentioned, tens of thousands of these. Who governs this? Is it well governed? I'll answer you in a minute. Then on top of that, there's the logical infrastructure of the internet which is essentially what I was responsible for at ICANN. Mm -hmm. That's what makes all the physical network bits look like one internet. So that includes IP numbers. It includes domain names and the root. It includes uh, parameters that are used in every router in the world. All of that is called the logical infrastructure of the internet. Again, how well governed is that and who governs it? The next layer which we've lived in for the last 20 years, is the app layer. Now, the email is an app. The web is an app. All those apps live on top of that. Once again, who governed that and how well governed it is? And then now, and this is new, I didn't have that layer until a year ago, there is this new layer called the machines. All the machines, all the algorithms, all the models living which need to also be governed. And who governs that? Every now, every day, there's 10 articles in every paper saying, we need a new agency, we need, we need something. Somebody's got to do something because everybody's freaking out about this new set of machines becoming part of our... Now, so quickly, the bottom part is well-governed, ITU, lots of good institutions, protocols, IETF, many people contribute to how this is well governed. And frankly, except for this new thing coming out of Europe, they want to go back to, you know, share, fair, share, all of this. In general, this is pretty stable and well governed. The next layer, the logical infrastructure, which I was involved in, is fairly well governed by probably one of the most progressive network governance models, frankly, to exist. And I spent time after ICANN at both Harvard, Kennedy, and Oxford Blavatnik talking about this because it's unique. And I'll touch on it in a minute. And then the next layer, which is the apps, is highly fragmented, highly fragmented, much more so than the networks. The, the logical infrastructure, highly centralized. I mean, Tim Berners-Lee says if the internet looks like a, a, an hourglass, then the logical infrastructure is the neck, mm -hmm. is the key mm -hmm. middle. But then you go to the applications. That's why you can't use Google in China, or you can't do this. I mean, it's fragmented. You can't buy Kindle books on your on your uh, Samsung yeah. phone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> something that's, drives me crazy. Yeah. So this is the app, and then of course you have the new machines layer. But let's not talk about this now. On ICANN, ICANN is. I, I must tell you, we were just meeting Alejandro and I with many of the uh, former board members, Esther Dyson and all the event we meet because ICANN is about to choose a new CEO. If any of you are interested, uh, it's the open application phase. <laughs> I can warn you after I'm off the mic, but uh, it's uh, there. So they gathered us to say, what kind of person can run this organization? And I listened to all my colleagues and I will tell you, Honestly, what was my contribution? I told them, make sure the person who comes to run ICANN, unlike me when I arrived, I came as a CEO. I know how to run an organization. And I came to find out that in a networked governance model that is truly bottom up, because many people call themselves bottom up, but in reality, they consult bottom up, but the decision is made in closed rooms, where only one type of stakeholders is allowed. That's not what ICANN is. 
ICANN carries the multi-stakeholder model from consultation to formulation to implementation to enforcement. It's very unusual. You will not find this elsewhere because it was required given the transnational nature of what we're managing, right? And so ICANN is a unique model. It's not perfect, but it worked. And when I was there, when I arrived, to be frank, I was the first person to run ICANN who kind of looks a little brown, who speaks many languages, who was from a different background. And, they, and I found out later they picked me because ICANN looked very, frankly, very US-centric. It was controlled by NTIA ultimately in its final decisions. NTIA? Being the US uh, agency under the Commerce Department that was entrusted specifically with changes to the route. So if we change something in the route, it had to be blessed by them. They rarely changed our decisions, but they had a veto power on that. And when Angela Merkel and Dilma Rousseff, when I met with them and they figured out this is the case, they said, no, we can't have that. We need a more open, transparent model where others are participating in that final call. Right? So what I did at ICANN was take it from 95 people, mostly in Los Angeles, Washington, and Sydney, <laughs> to 500 people in 36 countries. Uh, I internationalized the, the organization. I made it look like the world. And it was a great privilege to do that. And then the second thing I did, which Alejandro and others helped me make happen, was to convince the Obama administration who signed off on our plan literally days before President Obama left office to give up that singular control they had over the changes to the route. And this was important, symbolic, but important, that we, we created a multi-stakeholder approach that put guardrails so that I don't remove Russia because I got a call from somebody saying, Get, get Russia out of the route. I, I couldn't do that at ICANN. I really, the only thing I could change is the brand of coffee in the cafeteria, pretty <laughs> much. Everything else was everybody. And you would think this would slow everything down. You would, but it's okay. Sometimes it's good to slow decisions down. But everyone was at the table. And I learned this the hard way. As a CEO, when I arrived, this is what I shared at the meeting to prepare for the new CEO. I said, please make sure the next person learns that CEO is not, is really, it, 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 it's a title that's meaningless at ICANN. Uh, it's much more of a coalescer in chief, <laughs> of a person who brings people together, who co learns from the beginning to be a bottom-up cooperator, not a top-down decider. Uh, and it works. It really works. If you haven't been to an IETF or an ICANN meeting, go. It's free. Attend and watch people. At the IETF, the consensus decisions are made how, Alejandro? By humming. By humming. Come on. Yes. Serious? Yeah. That's how all the protocols of the internet were agreed to. So someone stands up, says, here's a new protocol to do X, Y, Z and a room of 500 engineers, most of them in flip-flops and shorts, you ask them, guys, if you are supportive of this new protocol that could change the internet, please hum. And if the hum of the people for or against is higher, it stops. You got to go see this. I, there are, I think you can find it also on YouTube. You can find some humming decisions being made about critical protocols to secure the internet. It works. There's no egos, there's no bosses. Everybody's there making it happen. So I have so many questions and I'm also <laughs> thinking. We can hum if you want. Uh, well, uh, yes, because I'm thinking, you know, Bob Putnam. Ask which question you want answered first.
It's <laughs> wonderful. Well, I was sitting there thinking that Bob Putnam's book on democracy in Italy concluded that the provinces in Italy that were that had the strongest democracies uh, had traditions that extended back to the number of choral groups in the Middle Ages, which is a evidence of civil society and connection. And now I'm thinking maybe it was just due to the humming all along. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> um, but so finally, there's so, that's just it's so interesting. I want to draw out some of the lessons of what you just described and ask you to see to talk about how well they might be extended. I mean, all, you're, you're looking at people who are in working groups thinking about governance of different areas. But I hear a number of things. I hear one, um, you had to expand it. Mm -hmm. You had to make it representative of the world. So you had to decolonize it effectively. I did. Um, you had to ensure that it was truly bottom up, I mean, or preserve that, that, that as you expanded it, that it, it, it genuinely was bottom up. And critically, a great power had to agree, mm -hmm. right? Because, and I remember this, and Trump, of course, never would have agreed. Trump, I mean, I'm not sure. No. I'm not sure they would have ever even really fully understood that they weren't focused on those issues. But that's a key moment, right? Great power, I mean, just as a veteran of the wars to try to reform the Security Council, no matter how progressive the US, the French, the British are, you start talking about giving up a veto and the door slams in your face immediately. So, so could those things work if you looked at, I'm looking at AI and algorithms, and we were just, you just said there was an AI group back in the 60s. If you're thinking about, as this group is, govern global governance or even regional <laughs> for AI and algorithms, can you imagine a similar kind of structure? I can. Um, we, you and I, if you, uh, as you recall, we wrote a piece four years ago now gotcha. on co-governance. And uh, we chose the term co-governance sure partly because multi-stakeholder versus multilateral has become a bit of a religious war. Uh, yes. Unnecessarily, frankly, because, you know, so even the Secretary General, in his wisdom, you know, if he used multi-stakeholder, he'd be booted off his 17th floor. So he used network, multilateral. <laughs> Everybody's trying to dance around the idea that we have to work together. It's essentially, so we, we tried a different term. We used co-governance as a more mild term that did not enter into these religious wars. But yes, there is a model. We need a thousand ICANs. Huh. That's what we need. And by the way, one of what I thought was my biggest failures at ICANN was I tried to expand ICANN to do more than its remit. And I was shut down down. I almost was fired by the board. And I worked with Dilma Rousseff. We did uh, the Net Mundial. I gave her uh, the, the impetus to do that. She agreed. We did it. And then the board felt, wait a second. We're now making ICANN bigger than it is. And the natural reaction of the board was brilliant. I didn't understand it then because I felt rejected. But they said, no, our remit is this. It's the root, it's this and that. <laughs> and even, by the way, the numbers. ICANN says, I coordinate the distribution of all the IP numbers in the world. Not true. Actually, within, you know, around ICANN, there are five institutions called the regional internet registries. One for Africa, one, et cetera. There's five of them in the world. And ICANN cannot tell them what to do, even though it coordinates them. But it has no power over them. I cannot force the European agency that di distributes IP numbers to do A or B. I can't. Even though I was the head of ICANN that nominally was responsible for IP numbers. That distributed model of sharing power is so effective. It is painful for a CEO because you realize, honestly, that you could only decide on the coffee. That's about it. At New America, you can't actually decide on the coffee. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> not I've even. tried to change the coffee. Nope. That's it. Not even. But not even the but coffee. My point is, it's, that, that it's, 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 it's really powerful when you think about it. And it's very hard. I, I had the privilege uh, recently of uh, 
visiting with uh, Pope Francis, who invited me to his, to his uh, actually to his home, to his little apartment, to chat with him a little bit about some of these things. And I was thinking of how he, the Pope, who is trying in his own mind to bring some morality to this digital space, trying to think uh, the week he met me, there were a few girls, that uh, young Italian girls in Rome who killed themselves on some meme on the internet. And he was distressed and asking me, you know, how do we govern that? I mean, who, who do I call? <laughs> how do I call? And it was difficult to explain the concept of distributed governance, that I, I'm sorry, Your Holiness, I don't think there's anyone you can call. So that's, that's the difficulty of a network governance model. I had it as a CEO. I'm sure His Holiness has it as, you know, who can I call to say, stop this, we have kids getting killed. And the, the, our world, as you said so well, Anne-Marie, is designed around a governance model that is top-down, run by governments, you know, and the transnational life we live in now and the machines that will be built before we blink moving forward is a world that those institutions are frankly totally ill-equipped to govern. Do you, but do you think, so, so let's accept a distributed networked networked in uh, uh, code for multi-stakeholder, you know, very inclusive, yes. horizontal, bottom-up model. Could we, so let's say we, we're trying to create a thousand ICANNs. My question immediately when I think about creating it, say for algorithms and AI, and AI for right now with all that money all over the place, I immediately think, well, it works for engineers. <laughs> But would it work for venture capitalists, just as one example, or for simply corporate power, or for politicians, right? I mean, I, as somebody who, who's, I ran a public policy school and I was always very struck just by the difference between the personality types of the people who went into engineering versus the people who went into politics. Right? Uh, it's an excellent question. And uh, I remind you a little bit of the structure of how the logical infrastructure is managed. There are multiple n networks, just like Anne-Marie describes them in her book, there are networks. One network is responsible for IP numbers in Africa. One network is responsible for uh, protocols in particular areas. All those networks are coordinated by ICANN. Yep. They're not run by ICANN, which by the way, took me two years to understand. <laughs> you know? It's not simple because I thought, um, I'm the CEO. I, mean, I go tell them, why don't you do this? And they say, thank you for your input, but <laughs> we'll gather the network. Then you needed a coordination layer on top of that. And that coordination layer includes all the stakeholders. So a bunch of experts may come together and decide, you know, how do we declare what algorithms are doing? That's a network of experts who come together, come up with that. Then they propose something. And it's made available to all the, the, the potential implementers. And in general, in the ICANN world, they implement voluntarily. Okay. Now, if people go out of the norms that we all agreed on, which are not policies or laws, they're norms, then there is a coordinating group that can actually get in and really say, you're out of line. You can't do that. Uh, that coordinating group includes, when I arrived at ICANN, there were maybe 25 governments involved. When I left, I had convinced over 150 governments to be involved. They did get involved. Businesses got involved. Everybody was involved. And yes, it's hard when you take a minister from Singapore who's coming with a very clear understanding of what's right and what's wrong, and frankly, super well-informed, and you put him next to an engineer who's saying, you know, we can't decide it this way, we have to go this way. It was difficult. Uh, but we need to grow a, a, a new crop of policy uh, experts who know how to coalesce these different people. And to be frank, I, I, I learned this the very hard way on the job, you know. But we need a lot of young, smart, knowledgeable people 
to permeate these environments with the understanding that we can bring and coalesce people. The problem, you put your finger on it, Anne-Marie, and I said it earlier when I said I underline, businesses have become very powerful. And they're the hardest to bring to the table. Yep. Governments are eager to be at the table because they lost, they know that it's too fast for them and they really want to be at the table. Some with goodwill, some not. But in general, they're, if you invite them, they're at the table. Civil society, at the table. Getting the businesses to the table was, and that's why I came from a business background, so that helped me to get the businesses to the table. We need more business people, and instead of attending Davos, which is fine, we should also attend the Milken Conference. Yes. Because these are the people who are feeding the business people. I've learned this the hard way after leaving ICANN. The real power is on the boards of companies, because CEOs will pretty much do what their board tells them to do. Yep. So I'm going to ask everybody to start thinking of your questions, and that goes also for our online audience, because uh, I have a, uh, um, uh, my, this wonderful tablet. Uh, if you submit questions via Slido, I, I think I will see it. Um, at, I'm going to ask you one last question before we turn this over. So the high-level advisory board that I've just been on, the high-level advisory board on effective multilateralism, just issues its report, and it talks about uh, six big shifts in the world that uh, will be needed for effective multilateralism. And one, the fourth one, uh, is a shift that will support a just digital transition that unlocks the value of data and protects against digital harms. So a just digital transition that unlocks the value of data and protects against digital harms. So positive, the value of data, but also the harms. Um, and specifically talks about the digital divide. And this is what I want to ask you this question. So we, we should be thinking about a just digital transition the way we think about a green energy transition. That we will not survive, uh, at, at least not as we have lived on this planet, unless we have a, uh, a successful green energy transition and a just digital transition. Um, and so that means we have to address digital poverty, inequality, uh, and harms. And so I, uh, my final question there for you, and the, the flip of that is to, to build a, a, an enabling just digital mm -hmm. architecture. How would you tackle that question? If, again, this, with this model of governance, when you put even governments at the table, not all governments, well, not remotely, are there equally. How do you enable, uh, again, we were talking about um, the, the African Union's digital strategy. How do you enable the African voices, the Asian voices, the Latin American voices, the voices of the vast global majority hmm. to, be, to have enough weight to get us to a far more equal digital world? Excellent question, and I, I fear that with AI, so remember I drew that hourglass where I said there are networks, and the networks are ubiquitous. Africa has great networks. I mean, most continents now have great networks. Then you have the logical infrastructure, which is most of us don't know about, but it's critical. It makes it all look like one. Then we had this app layer that allowed everybody to participate. Fragmented, yes. But open. Open. Fine. They don't want to do this in China. They don't want to do this. That's up to them. We don't like it. We will say it. But everyone could do what they want. I think we're getting into a new phase in that fourth layer where we're back a little bit to a highly concentrated thing. Why? Because running big LLMs, uh, language models, will require massive computing power massive computing power. And, and that's why you see how the administration is moving in controlling some elements of that. Because those who will control the computing power will control that last layer more so than the people who do LLMs. And of course, sadly, and marie the people who can afford to con and may have the power to control that layer are kind of a couple of 
countries. I mean, it's the US and China. I mean, there's just nobody else that will have the wherewithal to build the massive computer. Today, it costs Google about uh, almost 29 cents for every query on BART. When you go and put a query, it costs them about 29 cents. Electricity, machines, people. 29 cents per query? Yes. yes. A, a Google search costs them 2.8 cents, so about a tenth. So uh -huh. that's a big issue. That's why th these things, I mean, we still don't fully all understand what it takes to run these queries. And we're just at the beginning. We're asking it to write a speech, you know. Uh, wait. Sonnet. <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah, wait till we ask it to do very complex things. The computing power will be what will concentrate this. So back to your question, you know, how do we do this as, how do we make sure people around the world who will not have the resources to control the computing powers, how do they stay at the table? How do they feel they're still at the table? So that's, in my opinion, if Therefore, if the governance of those things moves to m pure, old-school, multilateral fora, then we kind of know that the U.S. and China will be controlling those fora, not necessarily for everybody's benefit. But if we, and there, and there is a war. I mean, this is, this is the new frontier. Right? There's no question about it. Um, I think that the governance models we've been talking about, the ones, frankly, you inspired me to focus on and ICANN has implemented, you know, in so many successful ways, but also with some issues, but very successful ways. Those are the only models, bottom up, that stand a chance to include everybody in how those algorithms will be part of our life. How will the new hybrid world work? What is our place in it? What are not just the guardrails, but what are the ways everyone could benefit? Because frankly, I'm a technologist at heart, so I'm not a utopian technologist. Some are. I understand the power of technology, and it's good. And I think it stands to bring a lot of good to a lot of people. So I also don't want us to take this thing and put it in a box because all the voices right now is control it, stop it. You know, I understand the fear, but you know, this happened before for the last century, every time a new technology came, fear. We should calm the fears. And I'm frankly, one of the things I'm about to write uh, about is the need urgently, and Marie, and you, maybe you could help with that, for a, a pugwash moment. Mm. We need, uh, for those of you who don't remember, in 1957, you know, uh, Einstein, Oppenheimer, uh, all these guys came together in Pugwash, Nova Scotia, in Canada, and they spent a few weeks quietly, calmly, in a private home. There's only two dozen of them or something. Yeah. And frankly, they came up with uh, a very beautiful framework that ended up years later becoming the non-proliferation treaties framework, right? But it started with some wisdom and some humility and some stepping back. They had ethicists, they had philosophers, they have scientists, they have people of goodwill. I think we need a pugwash moment now. Candace Rondo is nodding so, vi so hard her head is going to come off. She's been arguing for a uh, pugwash, exactly, a, a <laughs> That's digital why equivalent of the pu pugwash. That's why I was laughing. So we have a question uh, from online, which I'll start with, and then I'll turn to the audience, that actually really follows on what you just said. How do we address the fact that the internet is not open, i.e., the flip is, e.g., it's censored in many countries? Should they be allowed to work on developing governance principles? So, you know, everybody comes to the table. What if, you know, your vision of the internet in your country is very, is very closed? Do you get to participate in developing for everyone? You do. That's the power of the bottom-up network model. You know, we, at, at ICANN, as I said, we've never, ever excluded Russia, Yemen, South Yemen, whatever, we, we, we said, you have a seat at the table, but you don't get to decide top down. We have to build consensus. Once consensus is built, it bubbles up, and if it crosses some guardrails, 
The system is designed so it gets stopped along the way, but the decision is never made top down. If this goes to, with all respect to the Security Council, to environments where it's a top down decision, where the consultation is multi stakeholder, but the decision is top down. And that's where the danger becomes. So, yes, I, I think if people come from those places and they have agendas or, or not, or they have misunderstandings, that's the place for them to be at an expert table. And by the way, expert networks naturally weed out the non-experts. So if people come with political views at an expert network, it takes about an hour for everybody to tell them, thank you, Jose, very helpful, but you know, <laughs> we just need to get the work done. They're <laughs> about the work. You know, about the code, about the work, about the policy, about the protocol. And that's wonderful because it, it, it calms down the edges and it brings things together. And it's worked. It's worked. ICANN is not just engineers. It's engineers and politicians. And, hmm. you know, France, Fr France was Lawyers. one of the <laughs> most difficult countries to bring on board with, with the transition of ICANN. But at the end, you know, the rest of the countries talked to France and said, look, we need to do this. This is important. Um, so, and one thing I think it's very important to recognize that, that we looked at in this high level panel, consensus is not the same as unanimity. Mm -hmm. And that is actually written into UN documents, right? That we often think consensus and then we think, oh my God, you know, you, you know if you've ever tried that, you know, you sit there till three in the morning because everybody, but it, it doesn't mean everybody agrees. It means enough people agree yeah. it's not majority it's somewhere between a super majority and unanimity yes. is, is consensus so um so here there in the center and please just introduce yourself so that Fadi knows. the microphone is coming here it is thank you very much uh, i'm anna beduska i'm a law professor at the university of exeter in the uk uh, thank you for this inspirational uh, talk. It's very uh, important and interesting to, to hear your thoughts about that and your lessons. Uh, my question is, how would you think about the implementation of this vision of a distributed model of sharing power, bottom-up, together in, in, in a world in which we see a lot of backlash against traditional institutions, and also where we see more and more of uh, calls in the industry, in the tech industry, but also everywhere else, uh, calls to have more traditional ways of regulation. So we see in the European Union, for example, the traditional ways of regulating the field that uh, has been going on for a while with laws, with uh, laws that, that would have teeth, let's say, this way. So how, how do you see the, these two models squaring? How, how do we square that, that together? Thank you. You ask a very important question because we talked about consulting, formulating, designing, and then, okay, it's there. What compels people to do it? What is the process to do that? And again, it depends on each network. Part of what networks do is to recommend an implementation approach. Some of it is uh, voluntary pressure. Uh, that comes from industry. We're all doing this. You, you got to do that. If you don't do that, you're out of the market. You know, so there could be uh, mechanisms. And I, I am a contender that we should try everything before something is regulated. Because A, it moves much faster. If, if all of industry says, okay, yeah, that's the right thing to do. Let's move this way. It happens. Um, regulation of protocols that change, you know, version 1, version 1.1, version 1.11, and, and so on and so forth, the regulation can't keep up. And that's why when Europe issued the GDPR, they issued a directive, which was ambiguous. And a lot of people didn't know how, but it's because if they did anything else, it would have been, you know, dead on arrival because the technology is moving at 100 megahertz and regulation moves at 2 megahertz. And so that disconnect of synchronicity is an issue. Having said this, there are places where, and if we believe in the concept of subsidiarity, where in some locales, people are not, you know, voluntarily doing the right thing, then they can issue a rule or a regulation. But there shouldn't be global, 
uh, activity around that. There should be highly, as local as possible, <laughs> should be closest to where the decision has to be made. And then, of course, there are some things that are vital, that are fundamental. Uh, I, I'm sure for those of you in the AI working group, I mean, you saw the piece in The Economist two days ago by, by the Israeli philosopher, phenomenal piece, in which he's really questioning what our civilization will look like you know, once machines. This is existential and may require uh, some global compact around it. So some things rise to that, but we can't regulate everything. We have to be thoughtful, and if we rise from the bottom up, if the, if the momentum is bottom up, then the momentum should also say that the implementation should be largely bottom up too. And people should be given the opportunity to comply. And sh we should have peer pressure in the networks on them. Uh, and if they don't implement, then some businesses sometimes require somebody to handhold them into getting something done. But it should not be the first place to go. And today we see a lot of people calling for governments to step in, frankly, because of fear because of fear. And I, when I talk to my colleagues uh, in the Valley or business people who run companies, frankly, also because of our lack of leadership. We look like all we're doing is grabbing as much money as we can so we can make the race for our company. Great, we should do that. But there needs to be some voices also that control these algorithms speaking with wisdom, not just to their shareholders, but to all of us who will be affected. I mean, when Satya decided he's going to put ChatGPT in Bing, okay, he made the decision. I'm sure he consulted with a few people around him. Good for him. I respect Satya immensely. But he made that call. That's essentially a CEO making a decision that instantly affected the planet in a significant way. Uh, we need to hold these people responsible. How do we do that? By elevating those who do good things. Let's start with that. Why do we have Nobel Prizes for science? We don't have Nobel Prizes for CEOs who do the right thing. Let's yeah. elevate them. Let's put them on a pedestal. Tell all Because CEOs all want to compete with each other and look better than the next guy. Elevate the good guys. So uh, we've got... We got many questions in 10 minutes, and this conversation could continue for a long time. But I've got another one online, two, two from online. Um, I'll keep it short. I do just want to make sh I want to highlight something that I think is very important as you talk about these that sort of more horizontal, bottom up forms of governance. There are technologies can th make this easier, right? This is the work of, of the Radical Exchange Foundation, mm -hmm. of what is now called the plurality. Uh, research network looking at plural technologies, things like quadratic voting that allow people, you, you take a vote, you don't, it doesn't necessarily govern, but you can find out where, where, what people really think, right? So quadratic voting allows you to express your preference. I can put my 10 votes yep. on one thing rather than distributing it among three or four things. And that's very important because we, we have to be able to find out what people think quickly and and more effectively, and those plural technologies should go along with plural with exp experimentation and governance forms. I, I, I'm so glad someone brought this up. I gave a TED talk a few years ago where I described the three legs of the stability, the stool that would give us a stable governance model. Governments, of course, businesses, and the third one being us. And then people were questioning me, but us, how, how do we put our voice in? And because, frankly, to date, a lot of the, with all respect, some of you may belong to these groups, a lot of civil society groups also got controlled by businesses or by governments in some cases. Not all of them, but many have. I mean, very few people go to the IGF now because it's been seized almost by a few people. You know? It, it, so what you just described may be the solution it's to have our voices at the table. And our voices need to be an equal partner, three legs. We are the people, you know. We need to speak up with our preferences. And there are now technologies that enable that. To make it easier. I mean, there are even some people arguing that there are technologies to enable the coordination, that we could have a thousand networks and they're coordinated by AI. 
I won't go there, but that could be possible too. So a couple of questions online, one from, I think my old friend Bill Drake from Columbia says, there have been lots of digital cooperation initiatives that look good on paper but didn't get anywhere. And similarly, following up on the Pugwash point, it says, you know, Pugwash was disconnected from the decision-making layer. How could you get a digital Pugwash or a Pugwash 2.0 how can it get decision-making capacity? They're asking the same question. We can design all these beautiful things, but how do we actually, and we can convene important people, how does that then translate into the non-phone number decision-making capacity? Yes. Yeah. I'm always reminded that from 1957, when Pugwash happened, to when did the first non-proliferation treaty get signed? Maybe 12 years yeah. later? It, takes it took 12 years for that work to get there. Uh, we're planting seeds. We shouldn't expect these things overnight to... Having a pugwash of thoughtful people in a transparent place, dialoguing, raises our common understanding, allows us to understand the other, bring people together. We need more of this, not less of this, even if it doesn't immediately show a solution. Having said this, we have models of network governance that work. We need to quickly start replicating them. Now, ICANN cannot, because ICANN is a network in a way, doing its job, but ICANN could inform. Uh, how do we help a new network be built around an urgent subject? We have an anti-phishing network that was built super effective, working very well. So uh, some coordination between them, so people are not doing the same thing in 20 places at the same time. That's okay, but we need to enable this model. Where is the platform to enable this model? That's a good question. Because if I want to start a network, where do I start it? So we had designed a model where there may be many platforms. So maybe the, I don't know, the Ford Foundation could say, look, we're going to be a platform. <laughs> if people come to us and say they want to do a network around that, we'll just provide you kind of a temporary secretariat to get it going. Or New America, or a university, or others. We shouldn't concentrate it. It can't be in one place. We should just have a model by which different organizations own a subject, issue something that is understandable by everybody, share it, and make sure there is coordination amongst the others. It'll take some leadership, Anne-Marie. This was not spontaneously happen. All right, I saw many hands. There was one very, very in the back and one here, so I'm gonna ask those two to ask your questions and you can put them together and, and we're gonna have to close out. And I'm very sorry for those of you who did not get to speak. I'm... Go ahead. I'll be really quick. My name is Alberto Rodriguez. I work at uh, the Public Interest Technology team here at New America. My question is, um, you've alluded to this barrier of entry, which is technical knowledge. And ICANN works on that and is deeply enrooted in that technical ability. Yeah. But we are seeing new technologies and emerging technologies that are lowering that barrier of entry, making a lot of voices at the same time pretty chaotic. We are seeing also that as ICANN has to see what is going to happen with Web 3.0 and how that new influx of new players are going in a system that might not be able to manage them. So this is two angles for just one question. How do you think we could manage that chaotic energy of a lot of, uh, of, a lot of people that, ha that have entered this arena? Okay, thank you. And I'm going to ask Alejandro. Yes. Thank you. I don't think the mic is working. It is. Yeah, it is. Okay. Um, uh, very briefly, Alejandro Pisanti, National University of Mexico, uh, former ICANN board member. Um, <laughs> My former so you, boss. I was just saying, you were <laughs> funny <My> boss. boss. <laughs> not, not actually, but... Uh, yes. Uh, so, very briefly, uh, first, uh, one, one clarification point uh, that's very important, and I'm sure it was a pain for you, Fadi, every day, uh, which is that the route is only the directory. It doesn't carry the traffic. Uh, the root is only what? Directory. A directory. directory. It only tells your computer what other computer you're going to connect with. That's critical, important, of course. Uh -huh. But the traffic doesn't go through the root. Yep. The traffic goes through fibers, through switches, routers. Got it. doesn't go through the root. And this is a very important misconception because yeah. people in governments and everywhere else believe that ICANN actually controls the whole <laughs> traffic of the Internet. And that creates a huge pain for ICANN, by the way, because uh, it's believed to have a function that it does not have. Mm. Uh, so it's only 
and and this is the the question: How is it that the the internet is touted, and it is really a decentralized network of networks, and it still has one central coordination point? It's the one point that makes sure that everything else can work in a decentralized way. Uh, that's you know this is an important misconception that has to be dispelled. It's only a very sp uh, narrower function. It's a root of the domain name system. Uh, the GAC, the government that we, uh, uh, participation here is very important, very interesting. I just learned that Peter was in the GAC for a while, in the government advisory committee. Uh, at some point in 2002 or three, we offered the government representatives in a reform process that we were making, whether they would want to consider a design, a change in institutional design, where they would have seats at the board. Uh, we were even thinking of five seats for government representatives mm -hmm. so that they would be one per region. And the reply, after some consideration, uh, was twofold no. One was, we will never find a way for 150 governments to agree on five to represent us. Uh, and number two was, we, if we were on the board, we would carry the liabilities of any litigation and governments cannot carry liabilities in this. The, 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 the interesting thing about ICANN is that it's all built on private law, on contract law. The fact that if, if, if I register slaughter.com and you have a trademark that uh, I'm infringing on, uh, I have signed on the contract that I will relinquish it to you if you win an arbitration process. No, you don't have to go to litigation. So it's all built on private law. Uh, and this is a very, very important thing. So the governments are very powerful. They have an asymmetric power in ICANN. They have almost a veto power uh, on, on decisions, but they are not governing the organization. And that's, uh, I guess it was a long... <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, what I think for the future, uh, uh, complementing uh, Fadi's view is that you need these organizations to coalesce about a real problem that someone has to solve. Mm. You, you can have a thousand of them you have a, if you have a thousand problems and you have corporations that feel threatened. Uh, why was ICANN formed? Because very sign, net, then it was Network Solutions, feared that the government would actually regulate their pricing. So they accepted this very different process that brought in competition and yet uh, allowed them to take part in the policy making. And we call this policy, policy in this very strict sense, is the diminution of the space for arbitrary or uh, discretionary decisions. It's a process that doesn't let you just decide dot Lebanon goes in or off the, the route. And uh, they have to be issue-centric, solving problems, and find the resources from the threatened parties. Thank you. Thank you. So, Fadi? Thank you, Alejandro. And just to make sure, again, you get that, the route doesn't have the traffic by design again to make everything distributed. So you need the route to find things, but it's not responsible. It doesn't control the traffic. That's the power of the internet. This is why it's so stable and resilient. And you understand its governance, but also its architecture is highly distributed. Uh, to your excellent question, yes, it is more and more people of different backgrounds get together around these networks and it's all not always evident that we are at the same level of understanding, whether it's policy, law, or technology sometimes. So it's all of this, there's a variety. But that's the power of smaller networks because people then really invest in each other. They want everyone to build some consensus. So you find the technical person taking the time with the government person, the government person explaining the limitations of their laws. And I've seen that at ICANN. It's really quite remarkable how this happens in these networks. And business people who come in with, you know, this is not to my benefit. How do I sell my boss on this? You know, and we get into those debates. It takes longer. You called it chaotic. That's democracy. It is chaotic. It is loud. People will argue. But remarkably, for 30 plus years at IETF, ICANN, all these institutions, consensus is reached. Eventually, it's reached. Thank you. So thank you. This has been a fabulous conversation. And thanks to all of you.